sight to the blind. I believe that the dead came to life. I believe there are wonders and signs. You're still the same. I believe every word that you said. I believe there are scars in your hands. That your goodness is good without end. You'll never change. I will tell of your wonders, see your grace. God of creation knows me by name. The Lord is faithful yesterday. So tonight, uh, as you know, we've been uh, studying the book of Ezekiel. We are going to have a break from that uh, tonight. We will have a break from that tonight, but we will continue looking at an account from the Old Testament. We're going to be looking at a, a great story. I, I think it's one of the best stories in the Old Testament, and, and you're going to love it. You're going to love it. You're going to know the story. It's a very unique account that slipped in between the history of the Israelite people. And my title tonight is Prophet for Sale. Prophet for Sale. And we'll be looking at Numbers uh, chapter 22. So before we come around the word again, let's pray one more time and uh, just settle our hearts before the Lord. So we thank you, Lord, that uh, we can come now around your Bible as we study these, some of these verses in Numbers 22, we just ask that your Holy Spirit would come and meet with each one of us tonight. I, I pray that each one of us would leave here with a, a new and a fresh revelation of you, Lord, your power. And Lord, you would speak to us if where we need speaking to, Lord. You would encourage us where we need encouraging, Lord. So we just ask that you would come and be with us. We, we thank you for Pastor Andy and Kelly, Lord, and we, we pray that you would strengthen them at this time. Lord, when they're resting, help them to rest. 
And Lord, when they're, they're working for the family, Lord, we just pray that you give them wisdom, Lord. Uh, because we love them, Lord, and we thank you how they give, gave, they've given, given their lives, Lord, to, to just teach your word, Lord, and we appreciate that. So bless them now, Lord. Bless me, Lord, and just speak through me, I pray tonight, Lord, as we look at your word. And everyone who agrees says, Amen. Amen. So as you're turning to Numbers 22, let me give you a quick history lesson of where we are in the time scale of the Bible. In context to Ezekiel uh, that we're doing on Wednesdays and Hosea that we're studying on Sundays, tonight we're going to go even further back in time. Ezekiel, we've got a slide for this, Ezekiel is around uh, 590 to 570 BC that we're studying on Wednesdays. Hosea, we go back further, about 753 to 722 BC that we're studying on Sunday. And now we're going all the way back, way back for, to Numbers, which is around 1445 to 1405 BC. So we're going back around three and a half thousand years ago. Three and a half thousand years ago, we're going to look at this true account from the Bible tonight. A great story uh, written by Moses. It's the fourth book of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus and Numbers. And it's called Numbers. It's a strange name for a book, but it's called Numbers because it's based on the census that Moses carried out on the Jewish people. He carried out two major censuses of the people uh, of Israel. So the book is named after that, Numbers, Numbers. And tonight's account takes place during the 40 years when the Israelites are wandering around in the wilderness. They've miraculously been led out of Egypt, freed from Egypt by the power of God through numerous miracles. God has used Moses to lead them out. And when they come out, they're still disobedient. They still worship idols, the golden calf. And, uh, you know, God's not happy with it. So he just sends them off on a journey round and round and round in the wilderness for 40 years. So we're picking up tonight towards the end of that 40-year period. There's probably about year 38, 39 of that 40-year period. And tonight, as we look at these, this account from over 3,500 years ago, we're going to see that really things haven't changed. Haven't changed. We're going to see a false prophet today who's out for himself, He's out for his own glory, out for his own money. And do we see that today with pastors today and these false prophets out for gain? The devil uses the same tactics. He doesn't change. Why doesn't he change? Because it works for him. And we will see three and a half thousand years ago similar things that we see today that people are selfish and have self-gain. We'll also see tonight that God can use anyone even me, and guess what? Even you, even you, do this. Even me, God can use even you. Doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are, how long you've been a Christian, whether it's a day, whether it's 50 years, God can use you. And you're gonna see tonight that God can use whatever God wants to. And then the final thing we'll see is that God is in control. God is in control. God is in control from day one. And I like that where we saw the song, you know, today, yesterday, to today, and forever. God is in control. We might not think it sometimes when we watch the news, but nothing surprises God, and he's in control. And what's given to us in the Bible will take place. Amen? Now, for a full understanding of these events that we're going to look at tonight, we really need to read chapters 22 to 24, because that gives us the full uh, story of what took on uh, at this moment in time. But obviously, because of time, we're not going to have uh, the opportunity to do that, unless you want to stay till midnight. Uh, no takers. Oh, one taker. One taker, yes. 
So, uh, so tonight we're just going to look at a few verses from uh, Numbers 22. So by now you should be there. So if you're there, say Numbers 22, verse 1. We're going to read the first seven verses. Let me know that you're looking at it. <laughs> that was a distorted response, but I'll take it. So then the children of Israel moved, and they camped in the plains of Moab, on the side of the Jordan across from Jericho. Now, Balak, in the Hebrew, it's called Barlock, but I could never, I couldn't remember that, so I'm going to be calling him Balak. Now, Balak, the son of Zippor, saw all the Israel, saw that all the Israel had done to the Amorites, and Moab was what? Exceedingly afraid. Exceedingly afraid of the people because they were many. And Moab was sick with dread because of the children of Israel. So Moab said to the elders of Midian, Now this company will lick up everything around us as an ox licks up the grass of the field. And Balak, the son of Zippor, was king of the Moabites at that time. Then he sent messengers to Balaam, the son of Beor of Pethor, which is near the river in uh, the land of the sons of his people, to call him, saying, Look, a people has come from Egypt. See, they cover the face of the earth and are settling next to me. Therefore, please come at once and do what? Curse this people for me, for they are too mighty for me. Perhaps I shall be able to defeat them and drive them out of the land. For I know that he whom you bless is blessed, and he whom you curse is cursed. So the elders of Moab uh, and the elders of Midian departed with a diviner's fee in their hand, and they came to Balaam and spoke to him the words of Balak. So let's stop there. So like I said, the Israelites now, they've left in Egypt after 100, 400 years of slavery. God has freed them and, he's, and they're heading off now, but they're with Moses to the promised land. But because of their disobedience, they've been wandering around in the wilderness for 40 years. But they're nearly there. They can see Jericho. They can see the promised land. And our verses tonight are taken towards the latter end of those 40 years. And the Israelites by now are numbering hundreds of thousands, if not millions, in population. And they set up camp in the plains of Moab. We see that in verse 1. And to this point, God has given them victory against any enemy that they've come across. They've been able to defeat some of the mighty giants of the land there, Amorites being one of them. So when we look at verse 2, Balak, king of the Moabites, imagine the scene. He's sitting on his deck, he's drinking his sweet tea. We don't know if he had sweet tea or not. It doesn't tell us that. May have, may not. But he's sitting there on his deck. He looks out and he can see clouds coming towards him, trying to work out what it is. And then suddenly it's re he realizes it's the Israelites. He's heard the history of the Israelites. He's heard the victories of the Israelites. And now he sees them coming to his doorstep. And what does he say? Balak and all the people were exceedingly afraid. He says they were sick with dread. Why? Because they knew the victory and the God who had given the victory for the Israelites. Now if Balak, Balak knew his Old Testament, he would have used the promises of God and he did not need to be worried. Why, you ask me? Because Moab was the son of Lot. Abraham was Lot's uncle. And we see that in Genesis 19. And God specifically told the Israelites not to harm Moab. We see this in Deuteronomy 2, 9. So if Balak knew the Old Testament and knew the Bible, he would know that the Israelites were told specifically not to attack them. But he didn't know that promise from God. He was not living on the promises of the true God. He was worshipping false idols. And did you know 
There's over 3,000 promises in the Bible. Did anyone know that? No, you didn't. So we're going to go through all 3,000 tonight so that you can leave here saying, I've been through all 3,000 promises of the Bible. But there's a reason we study the Bible week after week, verse by verse, because we need to see what these promises are from God because they might and they will help us in our own lives. If you're struggling here tonight, don't turn to the world like we saw Balak do. We need to turn to the Bible and get the prom and work on the promises that God has given us. Amen? If you know of someone who's struggling at the moment, and you can see that they're, they're grasping for the world, every, anything from the world that will help them, you know, help them, give them some of the promises of the Bible and tell them they can trust in Jesus. I've got a couple of examples for you, just two of the 3,000 in the Bible, because it's important that we try and remember these for ourselves and for others. So the first one's from Deuteronomy 31 verse 8. Let's read, let's read it together because it's a promise of the Bible. So Deuteronomy 31 8 says, The Lord himself... Go so when I say read together, but read together, that means we all read together. We got that? Show me your thumbs if we got that. Okay, you're still awake? That's good. So let's try again. Reading together. Deuter Deuteronomy 30... Wait... Wait, Deuteronomy 31.8, the Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. And then John 16.33, Jesus said, I have told you these things so that in me you may have what? Peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart I have overcome the world. Aren't they amazing promises? They're for us. They're for you and me tonight when we go through difficult times. Notice it says in this world you will face trouble. We're not promised uh, a perfect life once we become a Christian. We will face trouble, but Jesus is with us in it. Amen? Balak, king of the Moabites, did not trust in God's promises. Instead, verse 5 tells us he sent for the help of this prophet called Balaam to come and curse the Israelites. So Balaam, what do we know about Balaam? His name is mentioned 61 times in the Bible. His name is mentioned in the Bible more than Jesus' mother, Mary, more than the disciples. So he's a famous guy mentioned, not for the good reasons necessarily, but he's mentioned 61 times in the Bible. In Hebrew, his name is Bil Am, B I L A M, which means not of the people. He was son of Bia from. Petha of Mesopotamia, we see that in Deuteronomy 23.4, which is modern day Iraq. So he lived about 350 miles away from Jericho, from where the Israelites are at the moment. He's about 350 miles away in Iraq, or modern day Iraq, Mesopotamia. And Balaam was famous. Think about it. He, he was like an international star. There was no internet. There was no TV, there was no cell phones, yet 350 miles away, he had a reputation for being this guy who could bless or curse people. So he was a famous person at that time, known around that region. He had this reputation for this supernatural power and for being able to put blessings and curses on people, even nations. He's, he was known as a diviner in verse 7, or sooth slayer, one who could tell the future as well as cursing or blessing people. But we know, we know when we hear this 
uh, job description, straight away we should be cautious of this man. Do you agree? We should be cautious of this man. We're warned in Deuteronomy 18, 10 to 12 to stay away from someone who practices this sort of divination, fortune telling, because the power isn't coming from God. The power is coming from Satan. He specialized Balaam in animal divination. And this is horrible, but, and I hope you've all eaten tonight. But he would inspect the liver of a ritually slain animal to one of the idols to ascertain from its shape and markings the will of the gods. I hope no one had liver for dinner tonight. But uh, yeah, it's disgusting. But Satan gave him power to be able to do this. And he was obviously extremely successful at doing it. An interesting fact, in 1967, discovery was made in Jordan of an 8th century BC inscription of the prophecies of Balaam. Now I'm saying all this because I want you to realize what we're reading tonight really happened. You know, some people will say, this is a fairy tale. The next verses we're going to be reading, you know, people are saying, that's a fairy tale. That couldn't have come true. This man, Balaam, was a real person. History shows this. And we'll, we're even going to see one verse from Revelation that talks about Balaam. So this guy was real. These events were real. And these events really happened. Balaam was a famous man of his time and he was in great demand and was extremely popular. But we know his supernatural powers came and his fortune telling came from the devil. We know that because we're warned to stay away from such things. So if you know people who dabble in this stuff, encourage them to look to Jesus. Show them verses where it shows that these things are not healthy because you can get... Uh, drawn into it but what's interesting is that you'll see as we go into our verses God can still use Balaam God can still use Pete God can use whoever he wants to and he does use whoever he wants to and he will use Balaam for his own glory tonight well not tonight from when it happened three and a half thousand years ago but Pastor Randy, for many months now, he's been warning us to be careful of these people, who we listen to, what we watch, what books we read, what we watch on you know, the internet. He's been warning us, and uh, we've got to make sure we, we listen and we watch what we watch, if that makes sense. There's a myriad of false prophets out there, and they're all seeking fame and fortune. So be careful who you listen to, however charismatic and famous they may seem. How do we know if someone is a false prophet or a false teacher? Well, we have the best book in the world to check against. What's that? The Bible. We have the Bible. So if someone is proclaiming something, you know, I know when Jesus is going to come back. You, can, you know that's a false prophecy straight away because the Bible tells us that only God knows. So check and use the Bible as our reference point. And verse 7 tells us that Balaam was a prophet for sale. The elders of Moab, the elders of Midian departed with a diviner's fee. They had money in the hand and they came to, came to Balak and spoke to him the words of uh, Balak. And as I was thinking of these verses, you know, and the fact that Balaam is selling himself for money, I was thinking, you know, for myself, you know, not necessarily that, you know, as a, a profit for sale, but I was thinking, do I ever sell myself out as a Christian? Do you ever sell yourself out as a Christian? And I'm not talking about salvation, well, I'm saying, do you sell yourself short when it comes to your testimony to others? An example I was thinking of is uh, at work. You know, at work, you know, do I join in with the guys when they're doing, you know, telling the crude jokes or inappropriate behavior? 
Does my family see me different at home than when I'm at church? You know, I'm at church and I'm all smiley. And, well, I'm never smiley, but if I, if I was at church all smiley, you know, am I different when I'm at home? You know, do we sell ourselves out as a Christian? Because God is watching us. God is watching us. God is watching how we live our lives. I'll, I'll share this uh, example from a few, well, about 10 years ago. The, uh, and don't share this with anyone, all right? Because this is a bit embarrassing. So I was, we, we, all the managers were sent to my company I worked for previously, sent us all to Atlanta and, uh, for a manager's conference. And that night, they were all going out. And that, I'd only been with the company perhaps a year, so this was a great opportunity to meet the CEO, to meet all the, you know, to get in with the people there. So they all were going out after the first round of meetings in the evening. And I realized because I said, where are you going? And they were going to an establishment that isn't very Christian. There would be ladies there. <laughs> and and, and this, is, this is for a moment, a split second, a split second, it went through my mind that if I had my back to them, I could at least witness if the opportunity came. But it was a split second. Don't judge me. It was a split second. And I said, no, I'm not going. I'm not going. But uh, it was for a split second. But we, we have to have that testimony of Jesus. And it's so easy, I'm telling you, it's so easy in this world we live in to sell ourselves out like Balaam as a Christian. So be careful. Be careful. Amen. So I didn't go. And I didn't get any promotions either. So... <laughs> It is what it is. So don't sell yourself out as a Christian. In Matthew 5, Jesus tells you and me, he says, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. So let your light so shine before men, they may not like it, but we're still told to do it, aren't we? Let your light so shine before men that they see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. I was, I was even talking to a colleague tonight saying, you know, I've got to, I was in a meeting, I said, I've got to finish at five. I've got to get to church. And he said, well, why? Because why? she knows I come on Wednesday. I said, well, I'm teaching Balaam. Numbers 22. And she says, what? And I said, well, you need to come. You need to come and you'll hear this amazing story. So she's not here, but, but the invite went out. The invite went out. So the challenge to us tonight is, are we fully sold out for God, or do you compromise your faith for the things of this world? Are your Christian beliefs for sale, not necessarily for money, but for compromise to the values of this world? Balaam was a prophet for sale. And he was being recruited to curse God's people. However, God had a different plan. Now in the interest of time, like I said, we'll continue reading from verse 20 in Numbers. We're going to skip some verses. We're going to go to verse 20. I don't have time to read the whole chapter, which I, I wish we had. But by, this, by verse 20, the Moabites have already come first round to Balaam once. And he's turned them down. What Balaam did, they came to him. And uh, what was one of the commentaries uh, said that prophets, when they were praying for different countries, they would seek that country's God. And they would pray to that God, even though it wasn't their God. They would still pray to that God and say, listen, you know, they want me to come and curse that. Are you okay with that? And so Balaam actually sought Yahweh, the true God. And God told him, he said, don't go with them. So Balaam told them he wasn't going with them. So they all clear back 350 miles back to Balak. And Balak's not very happy about that. So he gets some of his princes now and he says, more money. And he says, you guys go and try and bring him back. So now we're here at verse 20. <clears throat> so God came to Balaam at night and said to him, if the men come to you, come to call you, this is the second time, rise up and go with them. But notice this, but only the word which I speak to you, that you shall do. 
And then verse 21, so we don't know that the guys actually made it there, but look what happens here, verse 21. Balaam rose in the morning, saddled his donkey, and he went off with the princes. He met up with the princes and went back to Moab. <clears throat> 22 says, God's anger was aroused because he went, and the angel of the Lord took his stand in the way as an adversary against him. And he was riding on his donkey, and his two servants were with him. Now, verse 23, the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand. And the donkey turned away out of the way and went into a field. So Balaam struck the donkey to turn her back onto the road. Then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path between the vineyards with a wall on each side, wall on one side, a wall on the other side. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she pushed herself against the wall and crushed Balaam's foot. Good for her. Crushed Balaam's foot against the wall, so he struck her again. Then the angel of the Lord went further and stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn, either to the right hand or to the left. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she sat down under Balaam. So Balaam's anger was aroused, and he struck the donkey with his staff. <clears throat> and then here we come, verse 28. This is great. Then the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey, and she said to Balaam, I wonder what accent it was in. I'm assuming it was in Hebrew or, or something. It must have been for him to understand. But that she said to him, the donkey, What have I done to you that you've struck me these three times? And Balaam said to the donkey, he's having a conversation now with the donkey. Are you, are you listening to this? Balaam said to the donkey, Because you've abused me, I wish there was a sword in my hand, for now I would kill you. So the donkey now is going to reason with Balaam. So the donkey said to Balaam, Am I not your donkey on which you have ridden ever since I became yours to this day? Was I ever disposed to do this to you? And he answered, No. Then the Lord appeared, uh, oh, sorry, opened Balaam's eyes, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand, and he bowed his head and he fell flat on his face. We see some repentance here, but it's not long-term true repentance. And the angel of the Lord said to him, Why have you struck your donkey these three times? I bet the donkey's going, Yes! <laughs> Behold, I have come out to stand against you, because your way is perverse before me. The donkey saw me and turned aside from me these three times. If she had not turned aside from me, surely I would have killed you by now and let her live. And Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned, for I did not know you stood in the way against me. Now, therefore, if it displeases you, I will turn back. <clears throat> then the angel of the Lord said to Balaam, go with these men, but only, notice again, but only the word that I speak to you that you shall speak. So Balaam went with the, priest, uh, the princes of Balak, and now when, sorry, Balak, when Balak heard that Balaam was coming, he went out to meet him at the city of Moab, which is in the border of Arnon, the boundary of the territory. And Balak said to Balaam, did I not earnestly send for you, calling for you? Why did you not come to me? Am I not, an on am I not able to honor you? And Balaam said to Balak, Look, I have come to you. Now I have any power now have I any power at all to say anything? The word that God puts in my mouth, that I must speak. So Balaam went with Balak and they came to Kirath Huzar. Then uh, Balak offered oxen and sheep, and he sent some to Balaam and to the princes who were with him. Let's stop there. Don't you love this story? 
I love this story. Now, you need to do your homework because it's so rich, these chapters. So your homework is read chapters 22 fully, 23 and 24, and you'll see the entirety of this account that we're just dipping into tonight. And this relationship between God and Balaam and even with the donkey. But every time I read this, it makes me realize that God is sovereign. Amen? He will even use the ungodly or anything else to fulfill his promises when he chooses to. Balak sends one group to fetch Balaam with money, but Balaam seeks God, uh, who tells them he's not going to go. Balak sends his second group, this time higher up princes, and offers unlimited wealth to bring Balaam. Remember, each time they're doing this, it's a 700-mile, five-day, each-way round trip. And verse 20, God, knowing Balaam is pushing to go, tells him to go if they come back. But, this is the key word, he's only to speak what God says. <clears throat> And verse 21, Balaam packs his bag, jumps on the donkey, and he heads off to Moab. So why in verse 22 does God get angry with Balaam for going? He tells him in verse 20, if they come this second time, go with them. And we think the reason is because Balaam's heart was never right with God. In Balaam's mind, and we see this after this account, the Balaam was just about uh, money and fame. Money, fame, and what he could get out of people. And the idea here, here is that God was telling him not to go, but he gave in to the lusts uh, of Balaam, and uh, God was going to manipulate Balaam and saying, yes, you can go. But by going initially, he was going against God's will because he, in his mind, he never had any intention of doing what God was going to say. It was a selfish attitude. And we can see this in people. We see it in children, don't we? We tell children, tell them not to do something. So what do they do? They do it, don't they? And then we have to tell them off. But there's an application here for us, definitely. We need to listen to God and the prompting of the Holy Spirit. But we need to not only listen to God and the prompting of the Holy Spirit, we need to obey. We need to obey what God says to us. Balaam was going with false intentions and God was not happy about it. He heads off on this 350 Road, mile road trip to Moab. You can imagine as he's going along, he's thinking, daydreaming, you know, what am I going to do with all this money and wealth? He's already famous and he's got even more money coming his way now. Perhaps he was thinking, I'm going to buy a horse. I'm going to get rid of this old donkey and replace it with a horse. We don't know. But we do know God was not happy with Balaam, his selfish quest, and God appears as this angel of the Lord and stands in front of Balaam's donkey with drawn sword. And the donkey miraculously can see this image and obviously sees this image in, of the angel of the Lord and turns away on the first time, heads off into this field. We know that Balaam took two of his servants, so they're probably just thinking he's off for a bathroom break or something. But Balaam hits his donkey for being disobedient. And then in verse 24, we see a second time the angel appears uh, and forces the poor old donkey between the vineyards, between these two walls, and he crushes Balaam's feet. Again, he gets beaten for this. And then the third time, verse 26, the angel pins the donkey and Balaam in a narrow place. Look, we even have a picture of that account, of that real account. Wedged between the wall, uh, held up, and the donkey just sits down, fed up, and lies down. And by this point now, Balaam is furious and he beats the poor old donkey with his staff. 
And then we see this second miracle taking place. The first miracle is the fact that the donkey can see the angel of the Lord. The second miracle that takes place is that God gives the donkey the ability to speak and reason. Isn't that amazing? I thought, well, have you ever seen it? I thought it was amazing. I thought it was amazing. There's only two occasions in the Bible where animals speak. This is one. Do you know where the other one is? You can shout it out. The serpent, yes. Genesis 3, we see the devil appearing to Eve in the form of a serpent. I thought I heard someone over this side say, donkey and Shrek. That's not real, okay? This is real. That's not real. But yes, we have the devil appearing to Eve in the form of a serpent. And then here, we have this donkey given miraculous ability to speak. So Balaam and the donkey have this little discussion about donkey abuse. Donkey abuse. The animal rights would love this, you see. Well, they wouldn't be happy about it, but they'd be happy that the donkey stood up for itself. But don't you find it interesting that the donkey and Balaam have this discussion about the abuse, but, the, but Balaam's not really, doesn't seem surprised or shocked. Are you not surprised about that? His servants, we don't know if his servants could hear the donkey speaking, so his servants are probably thinking Balaam's gone mad and we need to find another job because all he can see is Balaam talking, having a conversation with the donkey. But God has given the ability of the donkey to respond to Balaam. This account makes me wonder what our animals would say to us if they could speak. What would Arnold Schwarzenegger's dog say when he lets the dog outside? Would the dog say, I'll be back? It's not going to get any better than this. It's a Wednesday night. It's a Wednesday night. What would my dog say to me right now? Stop trying to be funny and just teach the word? Yes. Balaam was out of God's will and all he could think about was killing this talking donkey. Not the fact that the donkey was talking to him. And in fact the donkey was winning the argument which is even more disturbing. And I thought, how do I apply this as an application to us? Well, yeah, all I could come up with is that sometimes, because Balaam was in his own little world about this donkey had annoyed him, and he wasn't looking at the facts surrounding this. And I was just trying to think of our own application where sometimes I think we can get entrenched in our own world, little world, that we miss what God is really saying to us. Has anyone ever done that? I've done that where I just get worked up by something so much that it's really not important and I'm missing the thing that God is trying to show me through this. Don't be like Balaam and have some miracle take place in your life and you miss the whole point of what God is trying to do. Perhaps God is wanting to use you to be a mouthpiece to someone perhaps at work or a neighbor, someone you wouldn't perhaps typically talk to, someone you're perhaps in awe of or in fear of. Perhaps God wants to use you today to be his voice and speak to them. If God asks you to do that, we need to be obedient because we're supposed to be the light of the world. Amen? Don't miss what God is trying to say to you today. God can even use a donkey like me to get his word across to you. No amens, please. So we may question it sometimes, but I think this shows us, and as you read those three chapters, God is in total control. Verse 31, the Lord opened Balaam's eyes to see him, and he repented in that moment. Balaam even offered to turn round, but God told him, carry on because I'm going to use you for my glory. And, but, but he had to say, you only say what I tell you to. And in chapters 23 and 24, we see how Balaam could not, he could not curse Israel, but only bless them, much to Balak's 
frustration. Balak took Balaam when he got there to a mountain top three times because every time Balaam just kept praising and uh, blessing Israel. That's all he could do. I'm going to read you one, the third uh, blessing that uh, Balaam gave. If I've still got that. Yeah, I've got that. So this is part of the third blessing that uh, Balaam gave to Israel. And what's funny about this is, and uh, I, I just thought about it, well, I thought about this, but Israel, all this time this is going on, this battle in the heavenlies, Israel know nothing about it. When you think about it, they're sitting in Moab, you know, waiting for God to tell them what to do next, waiting to go into the promised land. All the time, they don't know that this spiritual battle is going up on the hill by them where Balaam and Balak are arguing and God, Bal Balak wants Balaam to curse them and all Balaam can do is praise them and Israel don't know about this until afterwards. And it just reminds me that, you know, we go through ups and downs and we don't know I don't think we'll know until we get to heaven but there could be people praying for you there could be angels interceding for you and we don't know about it at this moment in time uh, but when we get to heaven I think we're going to see a whole bunch of things that were going on and people were praying for us angels were interceding for us and that's why we'll have eternity in heaven because so many things are going on in the supernatural that we don't even realize at this moment and these th hundreds of thousands millions of Israelites at that time didn't know what was going on but this was one of the third part of the third blessing that Balaam gave to Israel. He sa says, How lovely are your tents, O Jacob, your dwellings, O Israel, like valleys that stretch out, like gardens by the riverside, like aloes planted by the Lord, like cedars beside the water. He shall pour water from his buckets, and his seed shall be in many waters. His king shall be higher than Agag, and his kingdom shall be exalted. God brings them out of Egypt. He has strength like a wild ox. He shall consume the nations, his enemies. He shall break their bones and pierce them with his arrows. He bows down, he lies down as a lion, and as a lion he shall arouse them, him. Blessed is he who blesses you, and cursed is he who curses you. We need to be a nation that continues to bless Israel. Amen? Even though we may not agree with some of the things that went on, Israel up and down as we're seeing with Ezekiel, with Hosea, Israel are up and down all the time, even now. But this says, blessed is he who blesses you, Israel, and cursed is he who curses you. Balak is completely angry at all this because each time Balaam just blesses them, but Balaam, at least at this moment in time, is being obedient and saying what God is telling them. It's interesting also, and we don't know the answer to this, uh, but how did Moses come to write this, Numbers 22? Because like I said, he wasn't there. He was down in the valley in Moab when all this was taking place. How did he know what was going on here? Did the donkey walk down into Moab and into where the Israelites were? give the full story, the full account to Moses? We don't know. Did one of the servants, when they resigned, thinking Balaam's gone mad, did one of those go down there and say, we want to stay with you guys, let us give you this story? We don't know. But somehow this story got to Moses, who was able to put this in the Bible. Perhaps it was the Holy Spirit just speaking it through Moses. We don't know. But we can ask one day, can't we? When we get to heaven, we can say to Moses, how did you get the story? Perhaps the donkey's in heaven and we can talk to the donkey. We know Balaam's probably not there. I'm not judging, but when you read the rest of uh, Numbers, he, it doesn't look like he ever repented fully. Well, anyway, I digress. But what's interesting as well is when uh, 
Balak and ba uh, Balaam. I wish they'd have chose someone else for the king at that point. It would have been a lot easier. But when they're standing on the hill, he takes them up to various hills, they're looking down on Israel. And we know that Israel, when they camped, they would have the tribes on each side of the tabernacle. So as they're looking down, I've got a, a picture here, and we, we don't know if this is you know, the case or not, but what's interesting is they're looking down and he's, they're, they're, trying, they're giving these blessings. What do you see? around the tabernacle what shape is from a cross a cross so it's interesting that possibly when they're looking down they see this cross which again is a prophecy of Jesus coming later on as the savior and going to the cross we don't know but it's just uh, I just saw this and I thought well that's interesting I wonder if they actually camped because we know the tribes stayed together the different tribes of uh, Israel so if they did and there was more in some tribe than another but I thought that was interesting again you guys don't look that impressed but that's fine that's fine but it's another reference to the coming Messiah so what eventually happened then to Balaam we know that he was able to uh, bless Israel the three times what happened to him after that well it's sad to say uh, that he went back to his old ways he went back to his old ways his love of money and his desire desire to seek the occult eventually led to his death by Israel by Israel when they defeated the Midianites in numbers 31 8 and we know that uh, from the Bible some of these verses uh, that are referenced in the Bible we know that Balaam was not a good uh, role figure to follow these are some there's three references to Balaam in the New Testament so I'm just going to read them they're, they're short verses 2nd Peter 2 15 it says they have forgotten the right way and gone astray following the way of Balaam the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. Jude 1.11 says, Woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain, have run greedily in the error of Balaam for profit, and perished in the rebellion of Korah. And then finally in Revelation 2.14, it's uh, the church, God to, uh, Jesus talking to the church in Pergamos, he says, but I have a few things against you because you, uh, you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam. So even in the end times, there's going to be these same characters like we're seeing today. It's not going to stop. It's going to continue to the end. The doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. So we know Balaam did not follow God, even though he had this personal relationship with God, he just treated God as any other of these pagan gods. And Israel, we've been studying them on Sundays, we continue to see them bouncing backwards and forwards to God, even to this day. But we're told to bless them, we're told to bless them. There's no conditions there. We're just told to bless them. So again, we've only been able to scratch the surface of these incredible verses tonight. Our takeaways for tonight are to be careful who we follow and who we listen to. We need to avoid people like Balaam who are out to promote themselves and make sure we don't compromise our own faith for the world's temptations. If you know someone who's selling out on their Christianity for the world, we need to pray for wisdom, and perhaps God wants to use you to go and talk to them, even though you might not feel adequate, you might not feel you have the right words, God will give you those words. So never underestimate what God can do through you. If he can use a donkey, then I'm telling you, he can use you and me. Amen? Amen. And then finally, remember God is sovereign and his will 
will be done. Amen? Amen. As the musicians come back, let's close in prayer. So, Lord, we thank you for these verses tonight. We thank you for this real account from the Old Testament. What an amazing story, Lord, it is. And, uh, Lord, it's just a, a blessing, Lord, to just see you at work, Lord. You at work in, in these characters, Lord, that we've read about tonight. And I just pray for each one of us here, Lord. We, you've called us to go out into the world, Lord, wherever we are, wherever we are at, Lord. And I just pray that you would give us the words, Lord. Give us the opportunity to go and share your love, to share your gospel, to share your truth. For those, Lord, who are being led astray, we might know a young brother or sister or someone even more mature, Lord, who we can see is straying, Lord Jesus, is far going down the wrong road, Lord. Help us, give us the courage, Lord, give us the wisdom to just go and speak to them, even if we get rejected, Lord Jesus. Just help us to go out and do your will. And then finally for ourselves, Lord, just keep us on that uh, straight and narrow road, Lord. We thank you for Pastor Randy, Lord, how he teaches diligently, Lord, the word of the, the verse by verse, Lord. And we just, as I read these verses, Lord, I just appreciate more and more, Lord, that Pastor Randy is keeping us, Lord, on the straight and narrow by not diverting away from your Bible. So again, Lord, just bless him and Kelly, Lord, and watch over the family, we pray. And keep us safe now, Lord, as we head home. We just give you the glory tonight in your name. Amen. Yes. Yeah.